Okay, so um, as has just been said, my name's Ian Johnson. I'm from Open Lab at Newcastle University. Um, thank you for coming to my talk with a rather long title. Um, it's, I did think I might have had the longest title in the whole conference, but this morning I went to Bill Gaver's talk, and not only was his much longer than mine, he also had two colons, so that's something obviously we'll have to all aspire to eventually. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about a civic turn in HCI, and I'll talk about what that means a bit more. Um, and within this civic turn, I'm going to talk about an increased, an increased need to reflect on how we might go forward in the research and reporting of civic technology deployments. So I'll start by talking about the context of the paper and the challenges we face as HCI takes a civic turn um, before describing our two field sites, talking about what we did and what we found out, before touching on some discussion points from the paper and highlighting our main contribution. So in this paper, we detail field work from working with two community organisations who used our consultation um, devices as part of their consultation processes. <clears throat> and we did this in order to highlight the importance of reporting on the aspects of community partner work, which often goes untold. Things such as how questions for consultations are formed, how locations for devices are determined, and the ways in which data collected can feed into decision-making processes. So, as I mentioned, there's an increased tendency in HCI witnessed over the last few years to build civic platforms for consultation and voting. And what can be described as a civic turn, there's been a number of studies concerned with supporting the capturing of civic discourse, information sharing, activism, protest, and action. We've also seen more focus on developing platforms for community decision-making, and importantly, an awareness of the importance of handing over civic platforms to community organisations so they can oversee processes of decision-making themselves at a local level. This is particularly recognisable in um, Vasilis Vlachoriakos and colleagues' work on post vote where the, the, the ambition there was to build platforms to be appropriated and deployed by the activists rather than the research team. Post of all, raise questions around the governance of own and ownership of data collected and, importantly, in terms of how I'm looking at it, the influence of the activist groups on the way people voted. However, it's not really that common to report on the messiness of this type of work and acknowledge the roles and the relationships of all the stakeholders involved. Um, considering the role of the research is not a new thing, of course, um, along with the participatory, participatory design community, um, for example, the Dantec and Fox reflect on responsibility not just to provide new tools, but to help organisations and individuals develop skills, resources, capacity and the practices to use them in a meaningful and sustainable way. Um, in the paper, we highlight a number of challenges for HCI and civic technology research going forward uh, in the context of a civic turn related to the role of the researcher, the, me the messiness of decision-making in communities, and the ability of the community or organisations to influence how citizens participate in democratic processes. So I'll first introduce our um, consultation technology. So way back in 2013, <coughs> some of the authors from this paper were involved in designing and deploying Viewpoint. It was originally designed to elicit feedback from a community in northwest England. Um, and the locally elected members set questions for which residents could respond to with a binary yes-no response. Um, they were placed in a local shop and a library. Um, and although there was a lot of engagement, there was a problem that stemmed from the fact it was local members uh, from the local council who were posing the questions. And as such, they were controlling the agenda. So on the one hand, the study was successful in getting a group of people who wouldn't usually involve themselves in such decision-making processes involved, but on the other hand, this was in a very restricted agenda. So building on this first deployment uh, and some of the other findings from the report, Viewpoint 2 was redesigned to be more mobile, um, but more importantly put into the hands of community organisations themselves, not the civic authorities. Um, so despite the ch changes to the system, which we explain in the paper, it's the difference in approach that's most important here. And it's this, 
difference in approach with the second viewpoint I'll in talk about now with our two case studies. So the first study was with a campaign group um, campaigning for the pedestrianisation of Acorn Road. Acorn Road is a small shopping street in Newcastle in the UK. Um, and the campaign group were part of a, a, they were a local leg of a national group concerned with um, environmental issues. So three devices, viewpoint devices, were deployed, two in super, supermarkets and one in a library. Um, in this study, the technology was posed to ask questions with a multiple choice answer, mainly around how the residents got to and from Acorn Road and their mode of transport. Um, the data collected pushed the campaign group to soften their approach and they moved away from this idea of full pedestrianisation to incorporate cycle lanes and additional parking. The second study was with a local development trust. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a local development trust is, they're essentially an organisation within a community whose job it is to attract funding for community projects and coordinate regeneration in towns. Um, in this study, there was four deployed devices, and the technology was considered uh, configured differently again. This time it incorporated a touchscreen map where uh, residents could respond to questions by pointing to an area on a map. They were then given feedback of a heat map and they could then see the responses for the same questions from other parts of around the town. Um, furthermore, in this deployment, the community organisation themselves could ac access a website where they could set new questions, change questions and have access to some of the data. So both studies, the groups were engaged very early on in their consultation processes uh, where meetings took place between the research team to collaborate on the mode of interaction, the types of questions and where the devices would be placed uh, in the community. And at the end of each deployment, we conducted semi-structured interviews which were audio recorded. Uh, also in the second study, we interviewed custodians. Um, I mentioned custodians a couple of times in a minute. They are the people who worked or owned the shops and venues and places where the devices were placed. Um, so transcriptions of these interviews, along with the field notes taken from the uh, observations, were used to form one corpus for thematic analysis, where the data coding was driven by questions related to how the decisions that impacted on the consultation processes were made during the projects. The codes were then clustered into these themes that we present in the paper. So despite the deployments being valued in the communities that were placed, it's the critical reflections and challenges on practical issues and the stakeholder and researcher power and responsibilities that form the focus of the discussion in the paper. The mundane and often untold aspects of civic technology deployments. So as such, we present the findings from these two studies as a comparative narrative around the practical issues we encountered. Today I'll be focusing on asking the right questions and locating the devices. So despite seemingly handing over the technology to the community and campaign groups, the research team had a much stronger role than we envisaged. And the community groups themselves had a lot more influence on what was considered by them as a neutral technology. An example of which was around setting the questions. In Acorn Road, this meant taking into consideration a sense of being neutral, avoiding asking questions directly. As this member of the campaign group said, at first we thought we'd do a poll, are you in favour of pedestrianisation? But what would that mean? I mean, it might mean different things to different people. It also might lead to resistance, and people would be saying, oh, we'll come out and vote against it, and it wouldn't be a really very easy thing to get a fair result from. In the AMBIT study for the Development Trust, asking the right questions meant not raising expectations. They did have money to spend on regeneration projects, but didn't want to commit to anything new until current projects were finished. So, initial early ideas that we had had together around using words like regeneration and funding um, were very much softened and, um, to words such as change. Um, much more ambiguous terms which showed a kind of lack of faith in the community to understand what the trust was trying to do. Um, as they said to me when we were changing the questions, a lot of people, not everybody, but some people need to be guided. You know, if I was just to stop someone on the street and ask one of your questions, where do you think should be regenerated, I'm, I'm not so sure. So although there was no real desire by any stakeholder to obfuscate their intentions, 
Both organisations in some way concealed their motives in the form of acting questions. And it's the politics of this design is hidden from participants. Um, it could be argued by not choosing to reveal their intentions, both groups in some way stopped their residents and local businesses having their voices heard. And again at this point, the research team had an unexpected influence. We also had ideas about what the right type of question would be in relation to the software and how the software was configured. Um, and we also had an agenda to make the community which we shared with the community organisation, to make engagement lightweight and simple. Another example of something ostensibly straightforward but with several complex issues was around locating the devices. In the first case study, this affected the types of questions which could be asked as the pedestrianisation of this street was, was considered to have an impact on the two shops where we were going to place the devices. So as the campaigner said, so the atmosphere is pretty horrible. We discovered that there's a lot of resistance by traders to take away any parking because they say our customers have to park and have to drive. In the second study, despite the trust's desire to engage the wider community beyond the usual suspects who would usually turn up to their consultation events and a realisation by them of the potential of distributing something around the town rather than having to get someone to turn up at the same time in the same place as this court shows, it, but really what became clear is that they didn't have the social capital in the town to access all people in all places. So all of the ones they suggested and had access to tended to be the kind of more tourist areas and more affluent areas. So what happened in order to progress the research and get a spread across the town, I myself had to go and spend several days going around different venues um, trying to find suitable places and willing participants. But even with the kind of assumed neutrality of the researcher, this wasn't a simple task. But practical issues like finding PowerPoints and having space within the shops and uh, cafes was just a common barrier as politically motivated issues around a kind of lack of trust in decision making in the town. And again, obviously, this then becomes bound up in the research team's view of what a good location is. There are several other issues which we identify in the paper. Um, for example, some of the things we talk about, which we haven't got a lot of time to talk about now, are the tensions inherent in this type of civic technology design. For example, the design of very lightweight, quick interactions to get people to be able to fleetingly engage in decision-making processes often means the insights we get back are somewhat lacking. The design of viewpoint was purposely designed to cut out the collection of any noise and any richer conversations around the device, privileging instead the idea that participation could be done with the press of a screen. So if it weren't for the performance of the research around the systems, the richness and conversations and detail would be missed. The technology alone actually left space for the community organisations to start placing their own narrative on the data they collected. And so this actually was very different to what the residents, was, what was happening in the community. So the research team had to be quite active in challenging this and not letting them just set their own um, narrative, which wasn't right. Um, and, and there's one more point I want to leave you with, um, which is similar to this. Decision-making processes and the timescales involved in these are very slow and often out the, the outcomes and eventual outputs are juxtaposed very sharply against these quick, lightweight interactions that civic technologies afford us. Leaving a gap between engagement and action, that, cause, that may well cause a lot of citizens to ask what is happening with the data. For example, with the Acorn Road study, as I mentioned earlier, it's taken three years since that study was carried out for the work to eventually be done. It's a version of the original plan which includes the introduction of a one-way system, parking and a cycle lane, but it's taken a long, long time to happen. There's a tension here between eliciting quick, lightweight feedback in novel ways and the actual eventual outcomes of what is being consulted on. So, in sum, just to finish, presented work of two case studies where our consultation technologies were deployed by a community group and a campaign group. But this was a much messier experience 
with the role of the research team and the influence and power relations of many stakeholders played a huge role. We focused on reporting on this element because there is quite often a tendency for the voice of the researcher to be written out of such reports. Through our ethnographic insights, we try and give a rich account of the context into which the civic technologies are deployed. And as such, we highlight challenges and opportunities for HCI researchers working in and with communities, while asking that we take a critical look at the perceived neutrality of consultation technologies in context where only a privileged few set the questions, situate the devices, and have access to the data and the knowledge, ability, and social capital to be able to act on that data. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you to my co-authors, co-researchers, and the participants who took part in the studies. Thanks for the great talk. I uh, mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Xu Xiu, just graduated from Indiana University, Bloomington. Um, I'm curious, uh, in your team, uh, did you involve any uh, other um, experts from other disciplines, for example, public policy, public management, um, community development? Uh, because it seems to me this discourse could benefit so much from these uh, other areas. Uh, and, for example, uh, agenda setting, decision making process, you know, community you know, development. Uh, these are already. Um, studied uh, in several other disciplines, um, maybe they will enrich, you know, the discussion and anticipate some of the uh, issues. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I, th I think, yes, there are, I think there are things we can take from all of these other things, and we're not trying to kind of redo that. And actually, within, within our research team, we do have a mix of people that come from various backgrounds. So some people come from social science or political science and these kind of backgrounds so hopefully like that's and we're trying to kind of integrate this with more traditional HCI and computing science kind of disciplines um, and I think yeah that's a, a much more beneficial way to do it yeah I agree. Gilly Leshed from Cornell thanks for the talk it's really interesting um, and important um, so I have a lot of questions I'll just ask one uh, informed answering que questions that the citizens who are answering them are being informed, How, wh especially when you're asking short questions, uh, pro or against, or um, multiple answer choices. How do you make sure that those who are answering those questions understand really the issues and the problems and are being informed instead of just voting up and down according to what others, the, you know, the vibe around them. Yeah, I, I think that's something that we picked up on across the two case studies. I think what we tried to do in the second case study was, was give people a feedback after they'd responded and also give them feedback from other areas. But I think it is an issue, and as I kind of touch on very briefly, but we do talk about more in the paper, about this idea of, yes, there's a lot of the kind of politics into what if it's a multiple choice and you have these only these are four um, choices to make or again if we're asking a question even if it seems quite neutral point to somewhere where you'd like to change these there is kind of hidden politics that goes behind all of these and I think yeah I think one of the things that would be nice to do is be able to be able to reveal this to the participants at the point where they're being asked to be consulted on which is maybe something very difficult to do which is rather maybe problematizing this idea of this really quick lightweight interactions with civic technologies maybe we have to be looking at doing something different where maybe capturing conversations that are already hap happening rather than bringing people to these more kind of quick lightweight artificial scenarios <laughs> 